This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by World Anvil. This powerful web-based RPG campaign manager is perfect for building, organizing, and creating your worlds. You can use it to plan your games, create maps and handouts, and keep all of your notes at your fingertips during play, or even share them online with your group. They're constantly innovating with new features such as integrated character sheets for many major RPG systems, so you can manage your world and the characters in it. A basic account at World Anvil is completely free, letting you get a feeling for all the amazing features on the platform. Follow the links in the description below or go to worldanvil.com to try it out for free today. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at five of the most common cliche campaign concepts that we see Dungeon Masters using time and time again in their games of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, despite what you might think, cliches in this case are a wonderful thing. Cliches can help your players draw inspiration and attach to the core concept that you're creating. And today we're going to look at ways that you can use these cliche concepts not only to amplify the game at your table, but also what pitfalls you might want to look out for when you're digging into these core ideas. Cliches, archetypes, and tropes are powerful tools for storytellers and world builders alike. The important thing to know is why these things are such powerful archetypes and tropes and how to best use them. One of the best things about Dungeons and Dragons is that you are not the author of the story. It's a story that you are going to be telling together with your players as the game unfolds. What this means is that you can actually have a great campaign by putting a very cliched or classical concept in front of your players and ask, hey, here's the premise, but what are you going to do this time? The great thing about cliche story tropes is that one of two things is going to happen at your table. Either, number one, the players are going to discover that they are part of a cliche story trope that they recognize and they'll be excited to be a part of it. Or number two, they won't recognize the cliche story trope and you're going to feel like a creative genius for having this epic amazing story that they had no idea was coming. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So as we dive into these concepts, just remember it's never necessary to be bound by them. We always want to think of ways that we can make this concept more rich by changing certain elements and preserving what makes it so special. And I think one of the great examples of this is the evil overlord bent on world domination. It's such a great archetype, but there's a lot of ways that we can change this to make it much better in a D&D campaign. There's already a chance that you're a fan of a classic story that uses this trope. You might be a fan of Avatar The Last Airbender or even Lord of the Rings. Both of these include a overlord who is trying to dominate the world with their great armies. A lot of military campaigns and settings also have this sort of theme attached. What's wonderful about these campaign concepts is that oftentimes the players need to go across the world, gathering allies to oppose the evil empire, and you get these climatic battle scenes that can use house rules for mass combat and battlefields, and the players can really feel like they are saving the world in a unique an interesting way. Now, if we look at some of the pitfalls that you might fall into when you're designing this campaign, you need to look at your main villain. If the whole campaign revolves around the evil overlord and their conquest, you need to make sure that you have a solid idea on what the evil overlord's goals are and why they are bound to conquest. When the players eventually come toe-to-toe -to -toe with this great villain, they need to understand why it is that they have set out on this conquest and why why the villain has maybe even a moral high ground? Why are their reasons just and why do they believe that they are doing the right thing? One of the great ways to break from this trope is to have your evil overlord not actually be evil. Your evil overlord might have some pretty good ideals and might have some pretty lofty goals and might not even be somebody that is the stereotypical typical black armored villain with children chained to their armor who traffics with demons. They may be a pretty stand-up person, maybe even a paladin or a cleric who just has a certain vision for way, the way the world needs to be 
a vision that doesn't include the player characters and their way of life in it. Another thing to look out for with your evil conquest villain is to not give them endless resources. It actually might be more interesting to tally up exactly how many resources they have and see the player characters try to exploit and expend their various resources. If you give them endless resources, then the players can't really do anything to impact their end goals other than go and confront them head on. But having these interesting subplots of being able to impact their resource management is a really interesting way to bring a lot of levels and depth to this campaign setting. Another idea is that you don't want your villain to just be an overpowerful uh, combat god who is just walking into combat themselves, swinging their giant mace and flinging elves left, right, and center. You can have a lot of great lieutenants and people who are good in combat, but maybe your general, your leader, is more of a politician, making the calls and making political uh, movements to change and shape the world around them. If your evil overlord has lieutenants who can be defeated, or if they have resources that can be denied them, then it still allows them to have interplay and allows them to strike back and doesn't make them seem like an insurmountable force that is only ever going to be defeated in the set piece battle at the end of your campaign. Be open to a variety of ways that this villain could be defeated. If your players want to defeat your villain on the field of battle, that's amazing. But if your player character is like, no, 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 we're gonna take them down politically or we're gonna plan an assassination mission, all of those are really interesting and so let the players drive how the villain will be defeated and don't be completely bound by the fact that it has to be a final battle it has to be a showdown it can be a lot more interesting to play with that idea the next cliche campaign trope that we are looking at is the post-apocalyptic wasteland grim dark setting which we have seen many times in things like dark sun reign of fire even something like wally -E or fallout or the walking dead Whenever I encounter a post-apocalyptic world, there are two questions that always come to mind. First of all, what happened? Was it some sort of magical calamity? Or maybe a zombie apocalypse? Or maybe it was something much more subtle, like climate change or natural disasters that have actually caused a shift in the world. The problem with this is that you also have to answer the question, how long ago did this happen? And why hasn't civilization recovered yet? I love the Fallout universe, but the fact that the Fallout games are set 200 years later after the nuclear war is always something that really bugs me because the timeline just feels off. And so with a lot of post-apocalyptic settings where the apocalypse happened hundreds of years ago, you run into a problem of plausibility, but you also run into problems when the apocalypse only happened recently. In both situations, they tend to result in a world where it just feels like there is absolutely no hope. And sometimes it can be a little bit discouraging to be a player in a setting where there is no hope. It's really important that player characters have the option for downtime or have a respite that they can fall back to somewhere safe. And if you're slogging through dangerous territories for sessions on end, I have actually experienced as a player it starting to wear on me where every session is, are we going to die, are we going to die, are we going to die? I do enjoy having those sessions where we get to hang out at a tavern and talk to some townsfolk, go shopping for new gear and equipment, and actually enjoy our downtime within the universe. If your campaign setting has nowhere that is safe and everything is horrible no matter where you go, well, the players are going to start to feel bogged down by the weight of the world around them. I, it is a fantasy setting, but it can still impact the players if there's never anywhere for them to feel safe and rested. And if those places don't exist in your campaign setting, a great premise for the campaign itself is for the players to get to build those, to make a change, to put the world on the road of recovery. Maybe the answer to the question is why hasn't the world recovered yet is simply because the player characters weren't born yet and now the world is going to recover. And that could be an interesting story. Rather than going on for season after season after season, wondering what's going to happen, and the zombies are still here, and people still aren't working together, and we've been here for over 10 seasons now, and I just wanna find out, is this gonna work out? 
So this setting does kind of tailor itself more towards the lower end, or if you're designing a campaign with this setting, you should imagine that by the time the player characters reach a higher level, they are now going to be the change the world needs on a very high level, and they are going to be able to impact your apocalyptic setting in ways that will forever fix a lot of the issues that were presented to them early on. The next trope we're looking at is the totalitarian anti-magic inquisition, which we've seen in things like Divinity Original Sin 2, Dragon Age Inquisition, or really any of the Dragon Ages, and Baldur's Gate 2 as well. This has the players pitted against an inquisition of people who do not like spellcasting. And it can be a really cool setting, considering that magic is a prominent feature in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, there's lots of great ideas that you can pull on for these kind of settings. You get to have your organizations of inquisitors and witch hunters that are going out to find the evil dastardly spellcasters. You can burn them at the stake, and you don't necessarily have to attach the anti-magical inquisition to a religious organization. There's a really cool way of framing this as actually being a secular thing. That's a really great way to break this trope a little bit and make it a little bit more unique. But one of the biggest pitfalls that I see with this concept is that it is oppressive for the players themselves because so many classes in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition are really, really hard on spellcasting. There are players out there that just aren't interested in having to worry about the moment they cast a cantrip, all of a sudden 2d6 10th level paladins drop out of nowhere and slaughter their character. I think it's safer to make the Inquisition less prominent in the campaign setting, even if they are one of the major threats. Have them maybe be in major locations like cities and towns, but then out in the wild, your players should be open to be able to use their spellcasting. And maybe if they enter a major city, well, it's time to be a little more careful with your spellcasting. This way the players get to play around with their spellcasting and feel like the Inquisition is a prominent presence, but without it diminishing their play of the game. Furthermore, one of the core conceits with the question of the anti-magical totalitarian inquisition is, is magic a good thing or a bad thing? And that is a question that your players should get to decide. That is the question of the campaign, and the players are the ones that get to make the argument. Whatever the side they come down on on that argument is great, but if you've already decided, no, magic is a bad thing and this organization is right, or magic is a good thing and this organization is wrong, you actually cut out this interesting dialectic that can occur in your campaign itself. Another major pitfall to watch out for with the Inquisition setting is that this can actually land pretty close to home with real world oppression. This is something that you want to take care of if you're going to be implementing this into your world. Make sure that everybody feels safe and like they get to be the change in the world and that they get to stand up to oppression and help people do that together. You have to be careful if you're going to introduce house rules around spells and spellcasting. If you're going to introduce a house rule to your campaign world that every time a spell is cast there's a 10% chance a demon is summoned, well your house rule has actually made the argument itself. So it might be okay to walk away from creating house rules around spells and spellcasting and just let that argument be a cool narrative that your campaign can be built around. On the other hand, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition does make magic pretty reliable, pretty safe, and pretty powerful. And so the argument for spellcasting being a good thing in the rules of D&D 5e is pretty strong. <laughs> If you want a great template for this sort of campaign setting, you needn't look any further than the X-Men setting from the comic books or if you'd like the movies as well. It relies less on whether a mutation, or we'll say magic, is good or evil, and more so on whether the people who have that power are using it for good or evil and what their views are. In the X-Men setting, it's very clear that the government wants to shut down mutants because there is an evil group of mutants who are like, no, we're better than you. We're going to use this power to control the world. We're the next level of evolution. Then there's the other group who are like, no, this can be used to help people and work in collaboration with the rest of the world. And that to me is the most interesting dynamic on having these sort of powers. X-Men is also a really great inspiration for how to run a low magic setting. Because in the world of X-Men, 
Mutants are rare. They're becoming more common and there's more of them, but it only takes a handful of mutants to make a really big difference. Incidentally, all the protagonists and their antagonists are all mutants as well. Applied to Dungeons and Dragons, this could be a low magic world where all the villains and the heroes have magical powers, but the regular people in the world do not. And so that can still be a low magic setting where the player characters aren't barred from taking spellcasting classes because you're actually leaning into the idea that in most stories where superpowers are rare, the protagonists are the ones with the superpowers anyways. Next up, we have the rise of an evil god heralding an age of darkness that will destroy the world. Uh, this is a pretty common trope and actually most common in a lot of D&D campaign settings. So many of the official modules are basically, can you stop this ancient evil from returning to the world and completing an awful ritual that will bring in an age of darkness and or destroy the world? The biggest idea with this whole campaign usually centers around some sort of cult or organization that is slavishly devoted to this evil entity and wants nothing more than to conduct the final ritual that will instigate the end of the world. This campaign setting is awesome. It is a great campaign setting because there is a large threat and a great cult. Cults are always a fun thing to fight against. But there's one major pitfall that I have to say can really damage this campaign setting. And that is the idea that no matter what the players do, it's going to boil to the point where they are standing at the ritual site trying to stop the ritual and it inevitably happens. If you are the DM setting out to make this campaign setting, you need to be okay with the idea that your player characters can stop the ritual from happening. Because if your player characters do every single thing right in the campaign, they stop the enemy at every turn, and they masterfully stunt the ability of the enemy to summon this entity, then when they get to the end, and it happens anyway, they're going to feel disappointed and like all of the things that they worked very hard at through the whole campaign didn't actually matter. It's a bit of a catch-22 because if you're playing Rise of Tiamat and you don't get to fight Tiamat at the end, well, did you really get what you paid for? So the challenge with these campaigns is that how do you make the player character's actions actually matter? How do you make it actually relevant? And for, for me, well, there can be all sorts of things that influence the stakes of that final battle, like do they have reinforcements, do they have magical items, do they have the equipment to do it? The fact that the question of is this the battle that's going to happen, is that's never up for debate. It's going to happen. And to me, that's actually a weakness of this concept. I think that if you are planning this campaign, have the monster that you are going to be summoning set aside and make sure that the cult and the leaders of that cult is also an epic conclusion and a great battle to have. If they arrive at the site of the summoning of this creature and they have done all of the right things and the cultists are having a hard time dealing with the party, there will still be an epic conclusion as they fight off the party in an attempt to finish their ritual. And that can be a great conclusion as well, is the party shutting down the ritual from ever happening and defeating the major villains that they have known about who were controlling and pulling the strings this whole time. If you can have that be your set piece battle and the great demon that they are summoning be an extra added threat that if they screw up, could emerge to conquer the world, that being the, oh no, you screwed up scenario. That is really interesting. So you can mitigate this somewhat by choosing an entity as your summoned god that is truly unfathomable. But all of that to say is, is you have to decide whether you want this climactic battle and whether your players want this climactic battle or whether you have a group of players that um, are really into the idea of completely subverting that epic battle and not having it and defeating the cult in the end. I also think the other kind of pitfall that you can run into with this concept is leading with this as the core premise of the campaign from level one. I think by the time that you get to 20th level at the end of the campaign, the players might be worn out of that concept entirely. 
I like the idea of the concept evolving, like they know there's a cult, but what's the cult up to? We're not sure. And then as they level up, they learn about commanders within the cult. What are these high level people doing? Why are they moving things around from place to place? And uncovering the mystery of what the cult is up to allows you to level up the players to a point where they discover that they are planning to summon this entity. I actually think that this is a cool opportunity to slam this concept into one of the other concepts that we discussed earlier and actually have a clear break in your campaign. For example, maybe the first half of your campaign is the evil overlord and the evil overlord is defeated and maybe they survive or one of their lieutenants survive and then it escalates into this. This is another way to deal with this trope is don't introduce it right away at level one. Introduce it after the players have already had a major victory against another villain or another story as a way of escalating the stakes of your campaign. The last trope that we're looking at today is the Rod of Seven Parts or the Elemental Temple. Some sort of concept that has the player characters going around the world gathering pieces that will allow them to defeat the ultimate evil. But again, you have to look out for things that can make this less interesting or somewhat boring and bogged down for the player characters. One of the main issues with this campaign concept is that it can actually be a little bit repetitive. If you have seven dungeons, at the bottom of each dungeon is an artifact and each dungeon is leveled out very, very neatly, you've got a very, very linear campaign that has no room for alternate pathways or alternate growth for the player characters. There's also a very clear success failure mark. You either get all seven parts of the rod of seven parts, put the whole thing together, or you fail. So it's a very inflexible campaign structure. It's a useful structure, but an inflexible one. So one of the best ways to break the cliches of this concept is to explore how we can make it a little bit more flexible and a little less rigid. I think that an important concept here is, do they need all of the pieces in order to complete the final mission. Perhaps having all seven of the parts of the rod will allow them to more easily defeat the great evil, but they do have the option of only finding five of them, and that will give them enough power to present to the, uh, to the great villain and be able to defeat the campaign. And that player choice immediately presents the players with a more deep connection to the campaign and a way to feel like they're not being railroaded into a very specific course of action, but instead get to choose what they want to engage with within the campaign. You can also mix things up a little bit, perhaps even drawing recent inspiration from the Infinity Stones in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Some of these stones have been hidden away in ancient temples for generations and no one has seen them in years. Others have been a very active part of the world and have been used by guardians and other organizations quite regularly. So rather than having all of your artifacts hiding in a temple waiting to be plundered, maybe the temple, just like the space stone, maybe the villain plundered the temple already and has been using it to make weapons. Maybe one of the stones, no one knows where it is and the map hasn't even been found. Maybe an ally of the player characters has one of these artifacts and has been using it and actually doesn't want to give it up. Perhaps one of these great artifacts has been destroyed and the players need to find the pieces of it to rebuild it and find one of many avenues that can allow them to rebuild or reforge this great item. Or maybe the item hasn't even come into existence yet, but they need to find a power source and find a way to create this great and powerful item. This cool idea that instead of questing for the artifacts, the player characters can be the ones that build them. And in fact, the shape that that artifact takes is something that the player characters get to decide on is an invitation for your players to bring their own creativity and their own ideas to the game. And the great thing about this is that you still get to use those seven dungeons that you designed. You just adapt the MacGuffin that you've put in those dungeons and put those environments to the ideas that your player characters are bringing towards the table. So again, I want to iterate that these tropes and cliches are your friends. Lean into them, borrow from them, use these ideas and concepts or any trope that you love from a movie or video game or book. You can grab that and implement that into your campaign setting. All creativity is a bit of the art of choosing the things that you love and recasting them in a new light and putting them through the ringer of your own brain and your own creativity. 100% originality 
is an impossible standard and not even a very good standard for games of Dungeons and Dragons. So don't worry about being original. Don't worry about your players judging you for using these cliches and using these tropes. In most cases, they're going to be delighted by it. It's going to be an amazing recognition and they're going to have great laughter and be able to see, oh, I'm the hero in this story that I love. And that's a magical experience because it lets them look at those stories that they loved and been like, I didn't really think it made sense. Why did the hero do that? That was, that, that's what I wouldn't do. And so now in a role-playing game, they get to show what they would do. And that's really special. So this has been a look at five common cliche campaign concepts in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Tell us about your favorite tropes and stories in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. And we thank each and every one of you deeply. If you enjoy the work that we create here on YouTube, please consider checking us out on Patreon by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes of that campaign right up over here. And we have plenty more tips for dungeon masters running games of D&D right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.